Hey, everybody. Hi. Uh, as I'm beginning the program, I usually do this. Please tell me if you can hear me clearly uh, so I don't continue on when you don't hear me. <clears throat> and some people say, you know, why do we even do live? Because you have all these issues. Wouldn't it be better just to pre-record? And then you can do all your editing and you'll come out looking a lot smarter and you won't be tripping on things and, and all the, the, the problems with uh, being, being live won't be there, but eh, you know, <laughs> I like being live here with you. So I'm good. Oh, good. You can hear me. So thank you very much. Okay, everybody. Oh, right, we're good to go then. Okay. So let me, let me do the, the needful before we go further, which is first of all, please, if you like this channel, please do like and also subscribe. Uh, because the more subscribers I have, the more the channel is supported. And also hit uh, the notification button so you'll find out what, when the next show is coming up, what I'm doing. So welcome, everybody. And um, this case was, uh, someone asked me uh, to do this case, the Delphi murders. And, and as a matter of fact, if you're interested in having me look at a particular case, do put it in the comments below. Uh, or you can put it on Twitter, or Facebook, wherever you wish, uh, or here. I try to catch up with them. I'm putting everything on a list. Uh, I may not be able to do the particular case you're interested in, mostly because there might be no point in it. Uh, people think that a profiler can simply take every case and have something to say, and, and, and in fact, that's just not true. Um, a lot of it depends on what kind of information I have. Also, it depends on whether there's anything interesting to say um, about the case. And so I, there are certain cases which I just like, nah, that, that one, that one's not going to be on the list. Um, maybe someday, maybe something will come of it and it'll be uh, something new. Uh, anyway, oh, happy 4th of July, everybody. Uh, if you're here, I guess you're not at a barbecue right now. <laughs> I wasn't invited to a barbecue either, but I am going to friends' houses later uh, and just hang out. So, uh, but I do hope you enjoy your day. And if you're not here, uh, at the live, I guess you are actually celebrating the 4th of July with family or friends, so bully for you. Um, so let's get on with this particular one. Um, <laughs> Emily says, oh, the case of Weinstein, I can't, remember, how do you pronounce this guy's name? Weinstein, Weinstein, Weinstein. Anyway, was it political? Um, and the, that, and that, uh, uh, there's there's a couple there's a number of cases which I've I've talked about previously. Sometimes I stay away from them because because they're like poison, um, and people get really really nasty. Uh, not that people don't get nasty about a lot of things I say, but sometimes it's just like you know I just don't want to get into that. I'll have to look at that one and determine it. I mean Hollywood is an interesting place. I've spent time in Hollywood uh, when I was just 19 years old, and I know how a lot of Hollywood works. So. Uh, yeah, I probably do have commentary on uh, Hollywood sex and rape claims, you know, uh, and how the casting couch works along with that. So I may do a show on that one day. Um, and I, and I, the, as far as uh, the Michael Peterson case comes, uh, I, 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 I'm going to do one on that at some point because that owl thing is really kind of interesting. The owl did it. I hadn't heard that one before. That like is in the annals of crime history. That's probably a first. Anybody blamed an owl. So very interesting case. And I have put that one on my list already. So anyway, let's go to the Delphi murders, which is, 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 is one of the sadder cases that, you know, one runs into because it does involve children, young girls, uh, and they're, they're young teens, but I mean, uh, just, just so sad. So let me get out of the way of, 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 of um, uh, Abigail's face. I'm, I'm going to just give you a quick rundown uh, straight from my Wikipedia page because uh, that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, February 14th, 2017. So we're talking four and a half years now. Um, and it's interesting that we're talking about that because, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute. The police uh, on this case said it's not a cold case. And this was uh, two years ago. And now it's four and a half years. So guess what? It is a cold case. It was a cold case way before two years. And I'll talk about why it's become a cold case. Uh, the bodies of Abigail Williams, also known as Abby, um, and Liberty German, I believe that's how you pronounce her name, and uh, also called, known as Libby. So we'll call them Libby and Abby. So this is, this is Libby and this is Abby. They were discovered near the, and I don't know how to pronounce it because I'm not from, Indi from Delphi, Indiana. 
or Delphi, as some people say it is, um, Mo Monon High Bridge Trail, which is part of the Delph Delphi Historic Trails in Delphi, Indiana. And they disappeared from the trail the previous day. Um, and they, uh, let's see, uh, Ab Abby is, Abby who was here is 13 and Libby is 14. And her sister dropped them off fairly near the trail um, fairly, and, and where this huge bridge is. And, and they went for a walk. It was a, a warm enough for February day. And so, and it was a Monday. Uh, February 13th, and they had off of school, so they decided to go and take a little hike. And it wasn't going to be a long hike. The sister was going to drop them off, and then I believe it was uh, uh, Libby's father was going to pick them up uh, sort of around a particular time, at, or she could just call on the phone. And uh, that was the plan. And they'd done this kind of thing before. This is a popular area for teens to do, go to this bridge. And I'm going to show you the bridge just because it freaks me out. And I just kind of want you to understand what it looks like. It's like, personally, um, I'm, I, I remember back in the old days or, you know, where kids used to just run free and go to all kinds of, you know, scary places. And actually, when I think about it myself, you know, I, as a teenage girl, went to a place in McLean, Virginia called Burling Tract. Now it's called Burling Park. But at the time, it was called Burling Tract. And I went there as a teen by myself, wandered the trails. I went to the waterfall and didn't think a thing of it, like I was going to get killed there or anything. So generally speaking, that's not what you think. But what's weird of this one is, is the, uh, is the, oh, just let me show you a picture of the girls. I just want to show you a quick picture of just, you know, oops, I got to get out of the way of here. Just, just the happy girls. They're involved in sports and all kinds of things. They, they were just kind of normal teens. Um, and here, here we have a, here's a picture of the bridge. When I saw this bridge, I'm like, holy crap. Who would walk over this dang thing? It's scary as all get out. And I'm gonna I'll, let me show you a um, let me show you a a little video. I'm gonna see if my videos are working today. But this thing here here's the clip of walking over this this railroad bridge. I mean, this this particular bridge, I thought it when I first heard about it, I thought it was like maybe like like 10 feet high. So if you fell off, you'd, you'd survive. It's not. It's like 70 feet high. It's scary as crap. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's got no sides. It's not like it has handrails. It is about supposedly about six feet wide, a little bit further up past the, the, the wood that's on the sides. Um, but the, the sides are like four inches high. So it's not, there's nothing to stop you from tripping over it. Um, or if you're passing somebody by, somebody's just, you know, do one of these numbers. I would not like to be on the bridge with anybody. That would freak me out. I mean, somebody that wasn't with me, you know, somebody coming like the opposite direction um, or behind me, I think, oh my God, they're just pushing me out the bridge. Um, and also the, the railroad ties across the bridge and a lot of them are corroded. So you actually have to, you can see through them and then you have to walk carefully and they're, they're going to try to fix the bridge and make it better. But it's really kind of, I mean, I wouldn't do it, but apparently these teens had done, lots of teens had been up here. Nobody had gone in the drink before. So, okay. So maybe I'm just a chicken shit, but <laughs> I don't want to be up there. I just don't want to be up there. Um, but these girls went for this walk and the sisters dropped them off. And, uh, and then when they came time to pick them up, they weren't there. They didn't answer the phones. And then, and then there was a huge, you know, search for them and they weren't found that night. They were found the following day. And now let me try to show you sort of where they were found. Um, okay. Uh, they were found at, so I'll try to give you a, a view of the location. Uh, I'll put up this screen because it's got three different things on it, which kind of show you. Uh, I tried to pick the best ways to show it. So over here, it says well, that's where the bridge was. And they what happened was they came down across the bridge and they got off the bridge. And then they went down this hill and they ended up across a little stream, which you could walk through ankle deep, little maybe a little bit of your legs to get wet to the other side of that stream and you're found here. Um, and so you can sort of see uh, just uh, on this side, I just had a picture of the just the areas. A lot of trees at that time, which is why it was kind of you know it's just it was, it was winter, so less trees than you're gonna see in this picture. But uh, definitely, I guess still hard to find them. Um, and so that's kind of the basics. Now, the other thing that was very interesting about this case, 
which is which was very creepy, uh, which is why it's also gotten so much play, is is this this. So here we have apparently uh, Libby. They they knew some guy was kind of following them, so they were creeped out, and so Libby took this picture. It's actually was a little video of this guy, which is now known as Bridge Guy. Uh, pretty much every put anybody talks about it, they say bridge guy, not perpetrator or a uh, person of interest, but bridge guy. Uh, in reality, he's a, he's a person of interest. We don't actually know he is the killer. Uh, is it likely he's the killer? Extremely, extremely likely he is the killer. He was following them and then he took the video and then we also hear him saying something, which I'm going to play for you in a second. So I'd say 99.9% .9 chance he's the killer. So, but I'll call him bridge guy for now uh, because everybody does. And he's the guy who was walking across the bridge. Um, and so he was, apparently they were creeped out by this guy. And then I'll play you the video, which is why this has gotten so much attention. The, she still had her video going and she heard him say this. Okay, so guys, down the hill. And at this point, the, the question is, why was he telling them to do this? Uh, and the, the pro most probable is that he, at that point, had them in his control, perhaps with a weapon, with a gun, whatever, and saying, guys, down the hill. There are some people saying, well, it could have been something else. Some way like, hey, we'll go down the hill. Go, Guys, down the hill, we're having a drug dealer. Guys, go down the hill, we're going to have a party. But it doesn't look that way since the girls were creeped out just before he said, guys down the hill and down the hill would mean once they reach at the end of this this bridge thing uh there is a there is a hill and if you go down that hill and then go across as i showed you before to where their bodies are found which was a little bit of a distance um that would be when he was saying guys down the hill now the other reason this has become such a, a hard case for people to believe that nobody didn't um Wait, wait, I want to look at this. Uh, I believe the guys didn't necessarily occur at the same time he said down the hill. Yeah, we don't know. There's a kind of a break in. We, we don't know. The, the information on this case has been very unclear. The police have not been real forthcoming with pretty much anything. So, you know, we, we don't exactly know. But the fact that she was doing this, as, as you point out, Libby, Libby was so clever to think of filming him. Yes, she was. She was, she was you know... A, amazing that she did this. And, and it really hurts everybody that here's a girl who knew something was wrong. She went ahead and videoed, uh, had this thing going. And there's talk that, um, and again, we don't have absolute, so I can't say it's true, that the, the actual homicides may have been also videoed. Um, we don't know. Uh, you know, yeah, this is a quite interesting way. Could he be talking on a Bluetooth telephone at this time? I mean, in theory, in theory, that's true. But I mean, this is so, so the time frame is so short between when they say creepy dude following them and this happening and them ending up dead. I'm going to say probably not, but always worthwhile thinking about the possibilities. Um, so, so the, the, so we don't know whether the whole homicide was actually videoed, uh, but there supposedly there was talk uh, that this, this did happen. So they have more information that they haven't released, but the simple fact that in theory, we have a photo, even if it's grainy, of the person of interest, bridge guy. And we have a video of him actually walking along, gives us a feeling of his height, his weight, and, and his gait and all that stuff. It's pretty amazing. And then we have his voice, which is pretty amazing. So with all this, I think everybody expected, this is gonna be solved in two weeks flat. I mean, they're gonna catch this guy because heck, they already got this. And um, and a lot of people figured he was from the, the, the local area. So in that case, well, you know, on top of it, there's this is a kind of a small town. So, you know, we should be able to, we should, somebody should know this dude. And so should have called and said, you know, that's my cousin. That's my brother. That's my husband. Apparently didn't happen. And it's been four and a half years, which goes to show something. Sometimes we don't know exactly why we don't know. And even as a profiler, unless I'm working a case, unless I'm actually in there and I see every piece of evidence the police have, I don't know whether everything has gone well or everything has gone wrong 
or what, what what's wrong with this case? Why is it a cold case? And it is a cold case, no matter what anybody says. And police say they're working on it. Uh, they're probably most of the time it's on a shelf and they're just waiting for a lucky break at this point. Um, and I will discuss, so now I'm going to, what I wanted to just, just put out there, um, I'll talk about the, the first people that they look at and, and I'll tell you the reason why they were looking at them. Um, oh, hmm, should I talk about police, the police investigation first? I perhaps want to do this. Um, do I want to do suspects first or the police investigation first? Good question. Um, because they, one of the, we, we have a misunderstanding about how police investigations work and what should be done. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm going to do the police thing first. First, I want to talk about profiling. People say, well, this case should be profiled, blah, blah, blah. And you, you know when the best profiling happens in the first 48? Not on cold cases. Cold cases means that usually you can, you can profile the case. You might even solve it, but guess what? The evidence is long gone and you can't prosecute. Most cold cases get solved by DNA. And, you know, something hits in the CODIS bank, uh, you know, so the guy, maybe he left DNA, but he's not a, he's not a criminal at that point. Criminal, he may be, he may have committed five crimes, but never been caught for anything. Uh, he may not have a criminal record. He may have, you know, such stuff that never made it to the CODIS bank. But finally he gets 20 years later, he does something bad and his, and they take his DNA and they put it in CODIS and, oh my God, they get a hit. And it turns out he's a serial killer who's killed 14 people, you know, and they find that out when he's, you know, now when he's uh, ready for retirement or ready for a retirement home and he gets one in prison. But meanwhile, they actually didn't catch him through great investigation or great profiling. They caught him because they had a match on uh, DNA. So the best profiling is done in the first, 24, uh, first 48, just because that's when you have a chance to talk to the right witnesses. They remember things. You can get the evidence before it vanishes. And this is where I think the serial homicide investigations go south. I do not think serial homicide investigations are handled properly a good portion of the time because there's a wrong attitude towards serial homicide. And I'll tell you what it is. Okay, let me, I want to, I want to put this, um, this uh, police, the, this, the, this is, uh, this is coming from, I forgot who was in charge of this now. Um, but here, here we have a press conference. Okay. And in this press conference, this is what was said, and I totally disagree with everything that was said in this press conference. Uh, the beginning of it, for some reason, has no sound, but it'll just pa be patient for like a few seconds, and then you'll hear the sound come up. You'll hear what this guy has to say, and and I'll tell you what I think is wrong with the whole thing. We likely have interviewed you or someone close to you. We know that this is about power to you and you want to know what we know. And one day you will. A question to you. What will those closest to you think of when they find out that you brutally murdered two little girls? Two children. Only a coward would do such a thing. Oh, Karen. <sighs> Here is what I think is wrong with that whole picture. Okay. First of all, I believe we're dealing with a serial killer. You know, there's, I don't have any other, I heard some really weird stories about it, a revenge killing and, and somebody's after Libby's father and they killed her and all kinds of nonsense. I see no, no evidence of this. I see a serial, I see serial homicide here, a serial killer. Now it, serial killers are psychopaths, psychopaths. You, and what you're tell, saying to them, you have to be aware of the fact that they're they're taking in it as a psychopath, not as a normal person. So the first thing is you want a press conference that is not emotional because once he sees that everybody's emotional, he's getting a kick out of it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, look at you. You know, you're all freaking out. Ha ha ha. You think you can get me? No, you can't. Oh, you're going to talk about, I want to know what you know. Ooh, and when you catch me, you know, you're going to find out. Really? That just amuses him. It's not scaring him. If this is, they think somehow police think that serial killers can be scared into doing stupid stuff. No, they, that's not it. They're not going to start running around doing stupid stuff. It's, 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 it's nonsense. Uh, the second thing is he talks about how, how are your relatives going to feel when they find out what you did? <laughs> you think he cares about his relatives? You think he cares about other human beings? He killed, brutally killed two teenage girls. 
I don't think he gives a crap about his relatives or his children or his wife or anybody else. He does not care. So yeah, this is, this is correct. He's trying to play. He's Carter was trying to play mind games with a perp. Yes. And it does not work. Never has worked doesn't work. Stop playing mind games with a psychopath, especially it just makes no sense. What you really want to do, and this is what I believe is, is, is the failure. You want to get somebody out there in a press conference who talks in a very dead tone, just very matter of fact, very, very much. We you know we don't talk about what we've got under control. We don't talk about anything. We simply come out and say the such and such well, the police department, sheriff's department, uh, we're, we're going to give you where we are in this case. We're just going to give you very basic information. Uh, we are handling the case. We have a great investigative team. A great investigative team working on this. And we're working many hours a day, period. And then you say with a blank face, okay, here is what we, well, here is what, what the public needs to know. We already know what we need to know. We have evidence. Tell them you've got evidence. That will freak them out. We have evidence. We're not going to share all of that evidence with the public, but we are going to share other information with the public that we will that we believe could help this case. We are zeroing in on certain persons of interest, but information from the public will also help us know which persons of interest we have already spoken with or are going to speak to that are the, the killer of these two girls. Then you put a chart up, very simple chart. What you do, because you know, when the problem is they keep, they keep saying stuff off the top of their heads. And every time you have a press conference, it's a different information. And people go, I don't even remember what I'm supposed to remember. Put the chart up. On the chart, it says exactly the time, date and time the girls were killed. Okay, so in this particular case, it was, let me look back, February 14th. You put February 14th, 2017. I, and exactly what time or time frame? I believe it was somewhere around two o'clock. Time frame, put it up there. And you say, this occurred on a Monday. Who do you know was not working on a Monday or would have time on a Monday afternoon to be in this area? Tell people this because people aren't thinking. You know, what happens if cousin Joey got fired on Friday? And he's not going in to work on Monday. Maybe it's him. Or maybe it's a guy who works at night. So tell people, we need to know who it is that wasn't working. Or if they were working, had the ability to move around at that particular time of day. And have so much time to walk into the location, follow the girls, kill the girls, and walk out of the location. That's the first thing you want to tell people. So people can look at that. Secondly, you want to describe the person in general. Show the picture, say, and we do have the original picture of, uh, original um, sketch of the guy, which we still don't know has anything to do with them. Um, and then you say something basic, and you, but you say, but if you know somebody who doesn't fit this description, but you believe might have to do with this crime, yes, do call us anyway, because sometimes witness descriptions or whatever aren't exact. But do tell people, this is a psychopath. We believe he's a serial killer. He's a psychopath. And here's what a psychopath is like. He's a manipulative, lying son of a bitch. So, but you can say that nice. He's a manipulative, lying person. A person that, and you describe them. So the people say, gosh, that's, the, that's my cousin. My cousin does those things. Now, the one thing I believe they also should have told people was what weapon was used. Now, people ask, you know, how much of the crime scene do, do you describe to the public? None of the crime scene is necessary for the public to know about unless it can absolutely help them identify the killer. Now, the reason I believe that the weapon is useful, and I've heard this before, and it just makes me crack up, The police say, well, we didn't want to say what weapon it was because then the killer would know we know. Doesn't the killer know you know anyway? I mean, you know, you did do you didn't do the crime scene analysis and autopsy, did you not? You are, the, the killer knows the police know what weapon it is. But if you don't say what the weapon is, then people out in the community, for example, let's say you saw some guy throw a knife away, but you don't know that the, a knife was used in this crime, so you don't call the police. Maybe if, you, if, the, if the gun was a, uh, a 38, 
Well, maybe you know somebody with a 38 who was mucking around with it. Maybe they buried it in the backyard. Maybe they asked you to keep the gun for them, which actually has happened in another uh, serial. Another serial killer did ask one of his buddies to keep a gun for him once. And he never called in because he didn't think it was a big deal because he didn't know it was connected to the crime. Um, so that's the kind of information you want to give up. Um, also, uh, I mentioned this quite often, uh, there was a crime out in Maryland where the police chief rightly who also, uh, gave up information about the guy's foot size because there was a footprint, very large feet. He gave the exact, he gave a picture of the shoe, which would, you know, from the, from the uh, sole of the shoe, they were able to figure out what the shoe was, gave a picture of the shoe to the public and so exact size. And don't you know, he did try to get rid of the shoes, but his neighbors saw him running out in his backyard and trying to get rid of them. And he was caught on his first serial homicide. So saved probably about 10 women's lives, you know, by giving the information up. The one other case, which is very significant is, you know, usually when you want to keep weird stuff to yourself about the crime, because that way when the guy says, oh, you know, and I did this, and you're like, huh, nobody did know that, but you and me, um, that's good. But sometimes when you have a cold case and you're not getting anywhere, there was a case out in California where a guy did what they call, he did this weird cutting. He just chopped up clothing, not to cut the clothes off the women's bodies, but just for the point, you know, fun of it. Um, and that's what they might call a quote signature. Rare, by the way, in most homicides. People call things signatures, which are not really signatures. They're not something so amazing. But signatures is something a guy does for fun not for the purpose of exactly committing the crime, but for fun as well. Um, so this guy cut up these clothes in weird ways. And the, uh, the detective on the case said, finally, he just fought everybody in his department. He said, I want to put this information out. We're just dead in the water here. Put the information out and he got a call from another police department who's, that said, I arrest, uh, I, we arrested a guy, teenager, years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and the guy, he was cutting up women's clothes really weird. And, and the detective said, what was his name? And he gave them the name and they just interviewed the guy. So 40, 20 years later, still chopping up stuff weird. So if it's going to help your case, give the information up. Uh, it's not necessary to give up information like stab wounds. I mean, does the public need to know there were eight stab wounds and not 18 stab wounds? No. Does the person need to know if somebody's throat was cut? No, that is not going to help you identify anybody. So if there's weird things done though, let's say he took an item off from the, Let's say he took a, a, a piece of jewelry from somebody. Uh, you know, I, this was another crime. I remember it was a crime where the girl, the girl had like a, like a Disney, Disney watch. And they didn't mention that to anybody. But, you know, he could have given it to his girlfriend or his child, you no, know, his daughter, and said, here, I've got this neat watch. And that would be something worthwhile telling the public. Somebody says, well, you know, that's kind of creepy that I got. I got the dudes, uh, <laughs> this, 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 uh, my boyfriend gave me this necklace. Oh my God, you know? So give up anything you can to catch the guy because here's the problem with serial homicide. You have no freaking clue who it is. I mean, it's not like, okay, it's probably a boyfriend. It's a drug deal gone bad. It's a, it's a opposing gang. You got, you got ideas. Serial homicide, you have nobody. You have an entire community and people and people passing through the community. You do not know who it is. So you need the public's help to identify the guy, unless you get really lucky with DNA and just happens to do that, or the guy just gets caught driving out of town and you happen to stop him for a traffic stop and he's got a body in the car. You don't know who it is. And even with this information behind, they still don't know who it is, or theoretically, they don't know who it is. So get information out to the public every put it on a board make it easy exact time it happened who you should be looking for to give us information um and what you need to know that's specific about this crime that would help you identify him do that do it in a monotone don't play games with the killer it's pointless let him think everybody is looking for him and you have a big team that's all you need and all you need to say um oh yeah, well, this this is always nice. They're waiting for him to kill again. Well, Ladybug, sometimes, you know, that's and that's exactly what happens. They're hoping that he'll kill again and screw up, you know, um, which is really nice for people who don't want to be, was that the Golden State Killer, Mickey Mouse Watch? I don't remember. I don't remember. I th no, I think it actually, um, it, there might have been one there. Maybe it's popular, but I think it was in a Virginia homicide of two little girls, if I correctly remember, but I, but I may not. Um, 
So, well, this is a point. Well, I believe he still has a weapon used. I bet it's in his home or workshop. I think it was a knife used, if I'm not mistaken. Well, we have no idea because we do not have evidence that it was a knife. But I bet the weirdo has it. Well, two points on that. Sometimes they get rid of things, but sometimes they just like their weapons a lot. It's like, oh, it's a really cool knife. You know, I love my gun. You're like, dude, dump the shit. You know, but, but a lot of times they do keep it for reasons. And also because they're so arrogant. They think that, um, so arrogant that they think they're going to get away with it forever and nobody's ever going to catch them. So, you know, and, uh, okay. Um, uh, by the way, if you're on here and, okay. So if you're on here, I want to say, do not, do not put anybody's name up here that you have in your community or you decide might have done this particular crime. I already blocked somebody for saying their dad did it. And I just, you know, um, that's curious. Yeah. Um, oh, what's this? What do you think about the cops saying the killer may be right under our nose? <laughs> well, yes and no, or like, um, it's like, um, whoops, sorry. Like, um, he's pro the, th the point is he might well be from the community and he's somebody that you do know. A lot of times when people find out the, about a serial killer, they're like, oh my God, I worked with the dude. You know, I worked with the dude. I never thought anything of it. Or he lived next door. Or dang it, it was my brother. Uh, I don't believe it. Um, so sometimes he is right under your nose. And especially in a small community, he's going to be under somebody's nose. Now, it's possible that he left town. So that's it. Oh, this is a good point here. I think this one has two lies. One is respectable and the other is a secret life where he entertains his dark side. Well, North Star, that's, that's serial killers in general. Um, you have two types of serial killers. You've got what I call fast and slow. Uh, the fast kind are usually the ones that jump out of the bushes and knock them on the head. And the sl slow kind is usually like ones that like to take them to their basement and torture them for a while, uh, you know, kidnap them and torture them. Uh, the, the, the fast kind tend to have problems keeping jobs, keeping girlfriends, keeping wives. Uh, they move on from job to job. Sometimes they have a little criminal history and stuff like that. But a lot of times when you meet them, you still don't think anything of it. They still do live in the community and they watch football, you know, uh, the slow guys are the ones who have a more stable job and are more manipulative and may have a wife of 20 years and kids and all that stuff, uh, will kill people and then come bring a big hamburgers home and sit out with the family and nobody has a clue. So yes, um, they can do that. Um, for sure. Um, let me see what somebody else is saying here. Uh, Pat in general, for a case of the size if someone tipped the correct person in how long you think it would take L law enforcement to investigate, make an arrest. <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends on the evidence. This is very true. Uh, I don't know what evidence they have. Do they have DNA or do they not have DNA? If they have DNA, it's a huge boon, obviously. Um, as far as the tips, one of the big problems with these cases is they, they I, may, I don't know if it's like already two years ago, they said they had 3000 tips. Well, I guarantee you 3000 people do not know who this dude is. So there's people that call in for the, oh, my ex-husband did it. Um, I saw a creepy dude. Um, I had this. I think it's so-and-so from Alaska. It's like, he don't, doesn't even live near Delphi. He's never even been down here. Well, yeah, but he could have come down from Anchorage. Um, there, there, there are people who, psychics call in all the time. I know who did it. Okay. People wanted to get their ex-boyfriend in trouble. I mean, there's so many people that call in with crap. Um uh, oh, and this is a, this is, by the way, thank you, Pat. I believe he's a person of authority who, sh who sh shouldn't be there. Now, by the way, one of the things that happens is the longer a case goes unsolved, the more often they say the dude's a police officer. The dude is, you know, that always happens in every single serial homicide case, case that's unsolved. It's a police officer. The majority of time it is not. And it isn't even usually somebody who's all that, you know, great authority or anything. He's not like running the town. Has it happened that somebody in power or an authority or a police officer has been a serial killer? Yes, extraordinarily rare. Okay, so I want to, now I want to point out just the basic, the basic persons of interest, and then I'm going to tell you what my analysis of the case is. Uh, so let's look at the persons of interest, see if I can. Okay, so first of all, what happens in the beginning, um, Okay. Okay. First of all, they, this is, by the way, this is the first, this is the first picture they came up with, which sort of looks like it could be the dude. They said he was around 40. Okay. And then 
so some reason, a couple of years later, they said, no, no, this is the guy, this guy. I'm like, wow, those look like two entirely different people and two, like 20 years apart in age. I, I, we, they never explain the difference between these two supposed people. Now, I also want to point out that we don't know if anybody actually saw this guy. There's, there's very, very sketchy information about, quote, witnesses. Did any witnesses really see this guy? Was it, if they, did they even see him? And if they did see a person, was it him? Or was it some other person who now does not want to talk to the police because they don't want to be labeled the bridge guy if they were anywhere close to this area? Or, you know, or did they see the bridge guy but give a bad description? I don't know. And they, they've never explained exactly these, it's just very, it's very sketchy. So anyway, let's look at who they are. Now, I want to point out the first two people that a lot of people said, what about this guy and this guy? Okay, uh, where is this guy? Okay, here he is. Uh, this, I'm in front of him. There he is. Okay, now this guy, now they, let me let me look my, they, a lot of people online call him the flannel shirt guy because supposedly uh, Derek German, that, that would be Libby's father, asked him if he saw anybody. And this guy was walking around out there. And he was told that, um, by the way, this guy is the organizer for the Monin or whatever, how you pronounce it, High Bridge Trail. He, he works on all the trails and he walks around the trails all the time. Uh, he was walking on the trail that day. He told Derek there was, didn't see the girls, but he said there was a couple at the bridge or under the bridge or near the bridge. That's all, also confusing. Um, so he, he is very involved with the whole trail thing. And also he's got a brother named Dan who's into history stuff in Delphi. So those are, these two guys are really into the history and the na history and nature of Delphi. Now, could he, could, could he look somewhat like this guy? Yeah, he could. And he was on the trails that day. And one of the most interesting things about being on is, you know, when, when police interview people, Sometimes they interview the guy. He's like the first guy they interview. He's the guy that actually was around the area. Now, this guy was around the area. He was on the trails. He knows the trails. Could it have been him? Well, one of the problems is, is that he's not very young. He's in his 70s. Um, and he's got no criminal history, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. But it would be somewhat odd that a guy, in, first of all, that I, the guy doesn't look like he's in his 70s. Uh, the guy walking does not look quite that old. Um, but he might be in good shape because he walks around a lot. Um, but that that he would kill on his own, you know, right there on his own turf in the middle of the day, I think it's a long stretch. And I do not believe the police have him as a person of a uh, person of interest. You know, it's just that, you know, he was, that's the area he works. So, or is interested in, in volunteers and does a lot of stuff for the community. But, you know, certainly people are going to, the final shirt guy, you know, and did he actually have, because the guy, this uh, the, the this guy walking bridge guy looked like he might have had be bulky. Did he like rip off his? Um, did he have a flannel shirt underneath and rip off his uh, uh, his jacket and toss it? And then you know, so that's where people start looking at who could it be. Now there's another guy who immediately got nailed. And don't tell me his picture is gone missing. I'm going to be oh, angry at that. Seriously. Hmm. Hold on a second. I'm looking for it because every every time I do one of these shows for oh here he is something goes missing and I I'm like did I actually just not get it up there okay this guy now the girls were found on this guy's property Ron Logan um, just he had a lot his property is quite extensive so when the, the guy the bridge guy for, forced the girls across the stream and killed them there it was on his property poor sucker you know anyway. That he is a he is on probation at the time and we broke probation by the way which is he got himself in trouble by leaving his his property and going out and about when he shouldn't have been going out and about because he was on probation he was on probation for alcohol and habitual traffic violations um, so you know people go oh you know it's first of all it's his property Ooh. and secondly he's a, he's got a, he's got a little bit of a criminal history there right or at least some kind of misdemeanor stuff. Um, but guess what? Lucky dude, he has an app, solid alibi. He was actually buying some fish at Aquarium World in Lafayette at the time the girls were killed. Lucky son of a bitch, because can you imagine if he didn't have a rock solid alibi? I mean, they did search his place anyway, but I mean, and he's 77. It's pretty unlikely that that bridge guy is a 70, 77 year old dude. 
um, who suddenly decides to kill a bunch of teenage girls. So probably not. So now, but we have these two guys who are reasonable suspects as far as the first one walks the trails all the time. He's around that area. He was on the trails that day. The other guy his property. Reasonable suspects. Now, let me tell you about the, the other ones and how things go so, somewhat amiss when you're talking about who they are. Now, I'm going to try to get these correct because I'm trying to remember whose face is what. Okay, so this dude, I think he was one of the first ones. I think his name is Daniel Nations. He apparently has a sex offender from Indiana, but he was, he's, he was arrested in Colorado for running around with a hatchet trying to attack people with a hatchet. Um, creepy dude. People thought, oh my God, that's definitely him. But, you know, just because he committed a crime in uh, Colorado running around with a hatchet doesn't mean he killed the girls. However, I don't know what the police have done, how much they've looked at him and what kind of, uh, if there's anything there that makes any sense. Okay, then we got this guy. I oh, wait a minute, let me find him. I think it's this guy. So it gets so confusing. Okay, I think it's this guy. If I'm wrong, sorry. Is that the pastor dude? Wait a minute. <laughs> it's like there's so many different pictures. I think that's supposed to be the pastor guy. Um, this is a guy, supposedly an ex-pastor. He wore a navy blue jacket and a flat cap, which kind of looked like the bridge dude. And he or, he um, sexually assaulted and shot some, some women in a religious store in St. Louis. Okay, that's a, that's a creepy crime. That is that he's the guy that you know. Again, there's this problem people have is that there's creepy people everywhere. That's the problem. And you know, when you're looking at, you know, we got more criminals out there than people realize. I'm more psychopaths who do wild and crazy crimes. And I don't know what he particularly, you know, that if he's not proven to be in in Indiana at that point, in Delphi, Indiana at that point, it's a stretch. But see, people call these in because oh, it kind of looks like it could be the guy. Uh, okay. And then there's this guy. I think I got the name right in this one. I think this is. Charles Eldridge. Uh, he's from Union City, which is two and a half mile, hours away. He's supposedly a child molester. He looks kind of pudgy to me, but you know, could have been him, you know. But it's two and a half mile hours away. Now I live in I live in, uh, between Bowie, uh, and I'm sorry, I live in Bowie, Maryland, but I live between Baltimore, Maryland, and DC, uh, Washington, DC. Two and a half hours away from me is past Philadelphia. I'm I, you know, doesn't he have doesn't he have people to attack in Philadelphia? Why would he be coming all the way down to Delphi? Makes no sense unless he's a trucker and he's rolling through the area. Okay, and here's the most recent guy. This came up just recently in May. This is James Chadwell. Oh yeah, he's supposed to match the new picture. This one. Well, maybe he matches the old picture. Maybe he's in between both of them, so it's perfect, right? Kind of looks like both of them. Eh, okay, but he's a lot younger. Oh, and he's not that much younger. Anyway, he lives 20 miles away, a little closer. But again, uh, that's like. No, uh, you know, they have to look at his movements. 20 miles away from me is Baltimore, and I never go to Baltimore. And so why can't, you know, why wouldn't you just run around Baltimore? Why would you come all the way 20 miles away to my town? Um, he lives 20 miles away. He lured a nine-year-old girl into the house and sexually assaulted her. Um, so is he a creepy dude? Yes. Is he, is he scary as hell? Yes. He's got all those things going for him. The question is, is it him? Is it Bridge Guy? Okay, so... The problem is I don't know what the police know and none of us know what the police know. Um, so somebody says, I still think it's Chadwell. Why? Why? I mean, the, 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 the problem is we're just saying it's somebody because he's a creepy dude who committed a, another crime, but there's no evidence it's Chadwell. So it could be. And what, what depends was Chadwell where, what was his alibi for that day? Was he in the area? Could, you know, what, what do we know? What? He loved bridges and fishing. He loved, well, he loves bridges and fishing. Yeah, and so do a whole bunch of other people. That's the problem. And, and I'm not saying we sh the police shouldn't look at him. Absolutely, they should look at him. As a matter of fact, that's what they are looking at. Lots and lots of different people um, because they should. I mean, especially when you don't know who the hell it is, you better be looking at, you better be looking at everybody. But um, I think great. I have no idea what that is. Who is Gray? I think Gray did the best job of the, who's Gray? I'm trying to figure, I, I don't know who Gray is. Who's Gray? Somebody tell me. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> somebody said, I agree. I don't know who it is. Could the perp have staged, um, what's this a question? 
I, I don't know some some of the stuff coming in now. I'm not sure what anybody's talking about. Gray, who's who's Gray Hughes? Who's Gray Hughes? I have no idea who that is. Who is it? Somebody tell me who it is. I haven't got a clue. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to be honest. A lot of times I, I hear a lot of stuff on other channels and I don't trust what they say. And this is why I have this channel. Uh, people dig deep into Delphi. That's what you're saying. He digs deep into Delphi. Yeah. You know what? Probably digs too deep into Delphi because that's what happens. People start fantasizing a whole bunch of crap. They're not profilers. They're not investigators of, of, of depending on what they do. They get into, they, they rev it up. Does he have like 10, 20 different videos by now where he's going, Ooh, and then it could be this. And then we're doing that. This stuff pisses me off, pisses me off because they're putting out a lot of information and stoking people up. And that is, that's unacceptable because what it's doing is taking advantage of these young girls and their families by making money usually off of Grifting is what I call it. Grifting by stoking, getting people all excited, and bringing in new information that is meaningless and has no advantages to the case. Okay, I will only do this case once unless something huge happens and there's something to talk about. So the problem with it, most if they're going and doing case show after show after show after show after show, it's nonsense because guess what? There's very little information on this case, and I can cover it today. And I already have covered most of it today. I've covered the, the, the video. I've covered the, the voice. I've covered the location. And guess what, folks? That's all the public actually knows. The rest of it is nonsense. And people are making up stuff and carrying on all kinds of fantasy. It could be so-and-so and blah, 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 blah. And that's how they make their money. Sorry. It just it gets me very ticked off <laughs> when I see people doing that stuff. I'll check out his channel, but I've seen too many channels like this. I've seen channel after channel after channel of true crime, just taking advantage of people's fascination. And I understand why people are fascinating, but they're taking advantage of people's fascinations by adding in a ton of information that is nonsense. So this is all we actually know. Yeah, well, I'll see about Gray Hughes. He, so I'm saying he doesn't do, uh, I'm sorry. He doesn't do that. He agrees with you about the grifters. He's quick to shut down speculations. How many shows has he done on this case? One or a million? I'm just going to ask you, one or a million? People say that. I hear that. I don't know who he is. Is he, is he a criminologist? Is he what? Who is he? And why is he going on about this case more than once? Because it's nonsense if he is. Um, sorry. Uh, that's just my opinion. <laughs> he might be the greatest guy in the world. Just saying. Okay, now let me go down to what I think about this case, just the basic analysis. And number one, as I pointed out, I do believe the police, if they have an ability way to, Gray has done a million, he's a grifter. Thank you. That's 200. Oh, seriously? Jesus, God almighty. All right, sorry. Just not my thing. <laughs> Don't approve of it. Not my thing. Okay, so let's get to what I want to say about this case. Okay. I do believe, again, what I pointed out before is that, unfortunately, I believe the police investigations of serial homicide often go the wrong way. You have 48 hours, profiled as well as you can, get information out to the public, find the guy, get the public to tell you the stuff, but you've got to be very methodical. You've got to be very straight to the point and tell them exactly what they need to know because people can't remember and put up the, put up the poster, this, 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 and this, do you know who it is? Call us if something comes close. That's what they need to do. Especially need to explain what a psychopath is because the dude is a psychopath. And a lot of people don't know what a psychopath is at all. Um, and so they don't, they, they, they'll, they, if you told them what a, a psychopath is, they go, Oh my God. Yeah. I do know that this person has all those behaviors, but I never thought of him as a psychopath. But now that you mention it, he wasn't working on Monday afternoon. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first thing I think they needed to do. Um, if they have any more tidbits that that can be given to the public to help, I think they should do that. If it's just stuff that's gonna titillate the public about how the girls were killed, that's completely unnecessary uh, because that's just, that's just more more fodder for people on YouTube. So I'm going to just talk about what I think is likely. I don't know very much. And somebody said, will you do the show if you don't, you know, it's an unsolved case. Again, it's, it, I don't hardly know anything. So it's not a lot I can say. However, I do have one thing, which I think is kind of what I think is the most interesting thing about the case. Okay. So first of all, the guy 
is want is out there. There's no question he's out there in this particular uh, unusual region. It is unlikely to be somebody who's just wandering through town. It's not a trucker who's just driving through town, some a, a tourist driving through town. There's no reason why they would find this particular spot. It's a little off the beaten path. Um, it is likely somebody who definitely knows the area. Now, that doesn't mean they have to live in Delphi. It just means they know the area. They could live in the next town or they could just spend a lot of time there for whatever reasons. But I do think he knows the town well enough. All right. The next thing is, how did he come upon the girls? Um, so there's two, there's two possibilities. Well, there are three. And one I'll knock off right away. Some people say, oh, they were meeting somebody. They were catfished or something. I don't buy that. It's not like they were the video that they took. They were saying, is that the dude that we talked? Is that the dude? No, no. They, they didn't. They just seemed to think some creepy dude was following them. They weren't catfished. So now we're down to two possibilities. The guy was just lurking around anyway. Because sometimes you have that. You have in cases where people are killed on certain areas, you'll have like a serial killer who just like likes that location. So he keeps coming around that location because he knows one day he's going to get lucky. That is a possibility. Uh, so he could always walk this area or walk it often enough and say, you know, one day I'm going to get some guy, some girl's going to be here by herself and I'm going to grab her, you know. Um, or, and the second thing is, he may well have seen the girls being dropped off. And this is a, if this can be the kind of thing where people have to understand how serial killers think sometimes. They they don't kill very often. Really they don't. Not 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 every month, you know, by the moon like you know it's on TV. They they uh they kill when they're in the mood for it. And many times there's a year or two downtime between, sometimes even more. Some of them are just opportunists. Now this guy didn't there uh this may be a crime of opportunity for him that that day he had the opportunity. So what could have happened? And this, he may well have seen the girls being dropped off on the, on the, at the side of the road. Now, oh, uh, there was this claim. Um, true, there was a vehicle, might have been a truck, I believe, in the parking area. That is something that's a possibility, but I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. And this person said more than one person involved. No evidence of that whatsoever. They saw one guy was following them and that's all they saw. And unless somebody else was hiding in the bushes, I don't believe so. I think it's a one guy. Um, uh, this also, he knew, Holly says he knew the area. Otherwise, if, if seen, he wouldn't know where to run an opportunist. Yeah, um, you want you want to, un, you, oops, I just lost this one. Uh, um, uh, wait, how do I get this? Okay, so yeah, so it's possible he just had parked there and was wandering around and got lucky or he saw the girls being dropped off. Now, what fascinates me is, and I'll show you what fascinates me. If you look at these pictures, okay, see where the girl, okay, I'm going to try to do this here. Cause you know, it's, it's not, it's not like I'm pointing at a board here. Okay. I'm pointing over here. Okay. So the bridge, the girls are dropped off more around that, you know, this other let's say, off the page here, that the other side of the bridge. It's anyway, they're coming down. They're coming. Where's my hand? They're coming down across down this bridge. All right. They get here. That's where theoretically he says, guys, down the hill. And then they, they they go over here. I can't do this. This is really hard. Uh across it forces them across a small stream. That's where their bodies were found here. Above that is a cemetery. Right there is a cemetery. Now, I'll tell you why the cemetery fascinates me. As you can see, also you can see it over here. That's a cemetery up there. You see how it's on the road right there? right on the road there. Now, there are a number of people who have said they thought he parked at the cemetery. Now, I'll tell you why I think that's a great possibility. You, let's assume you're driving down the road and in front of you is a car that pulls over and drops off two girls to where you know kid, people go and walk across that bridge. Now, the one thing you want to do after you kill off a couple people is not have to walk for a really, really long way back down the trail, going back across the bridge where you might run into somebody and you got maybe a blood on you. Maybe you're just messed up. People can see your face. Do you really want to kill the girls here and then walk back up that bridge and, and go back someplace and walk past possibly people because you do not know how many people are coming down that way. Now at the other end here, that's where it stops. So there's not many people down there. Once you get across the bridge, people usually just go back. Now, the fact that he took them over to this spot across the river tells me he knows that area well enough to 
push those girls that direction in an area where he knows probably nobody is. And nobody's going to see him. Nobody's going to come across the bridge and see him doing something to these girls. So now he's going to move them back across that little river and attack them on the other side where he knows it's empty. He's on, you know, and, and really he's got, he's got some time to work if he wants to work now. Now, so now he's over here and he's at that spot. I have to make a finger do it. He's at that spot. He kills the girls. As I say, I think it makes no sense that he's then going to walk and go all the way back up to some car or way back over here. No, I think it's far more likely that the, one of the reasons he also took, took the girls here is because all he had to do was keep going through that dead area there straight to his car. And nobody's going to see him. He can slip right through there, right back to his car. So if he's driving down the road and he sees that the sister pull over and the two girls get out, and two girls are there getting out and going for a walk, all he has to do is go just a speck further down the road, park at the cemetery, come down, come down here. Now he's at the, this part. If the girls are coming over the bridge, he's going to see them. They're going to be coming to him. Now he may have walked up with the bridge because he was curious and saw where are they coming at. Then they pass him at some point or he turns around. We, that's quite questionable. Um, but that's when they see him there and they are in his vicinity now. He also knows who's behind him. You know, when, you, when you're going to kill somebody, you really want to know who's behind you. You want to be sure there's nobody else in the area. So when he comes down here, if he comes from his car, he knows nobody is here. And then he walks up that bridge. He also knows nobody's where when he's, he knows what's going on. Nothing's there. Girls come down. He could have waited on the other side of the bridge. He could have gone and waited on the other side, let them go by, let them walk into his thing, come behind them. And that's when they turned and took the picture. Or it's possible they came down here and he just he just knew they couldn't cross the bridge again without him seeing him. He might have gone up on the bridge up here, up here and just did a U-turn and came back. He could have done that. Not quite sure, you know, the, whether he went all the way out across the bridge or he just went up and came back a little bit. We don't know. But the point being that he had to know that little area really well. And so I believe he has to be somebody who's fairly local to that area and has walked that before and is very familiar with that. Uh, and if he, I say, I think the cemetery is the most likely place to park because that's the way when you kill the girls, straight shot to your car very quick, ten, less than 10 minutes through, some, so through the trees and you're covered. Why are you going up here? You're covered. Nobody's going to see you until you get up here and you can look all around. Anybody coming, jump into your car and get the hell out of there. So that to me is now she points out this visiting a grave. Eh, I thought about that myself. Uh, you know, was he there for some other reason, but he wouldn't have seen the girls at the cemetery at all. I mean, and I don't, and, it, and I don't think if he didn't see the girls, I don't know that he, well, let me put it this way. Could he, and this is something the police should check out. Yes. I agree with you. North star. He could have theoretically, let's say it was his day off and he went to the graveyard to visit a grave for some reason. I don't know. I don't know if the Delphi, uh, this Delphi cemetery is like ancient historical stuff or whether it's more like he could have buried his mom the, you know, uh, uh, a month ago. And therefore he's visiting mom's grave. And then he's there and says, well, I got nothing else to do. Let me go down to the bridge. And he comes down to the bridge and oh, lucky day, two girls. That is possible. So I would think North star that the police should definitely check out anybody who might've been visiting the graveyard, especially if somebody, especially if they bury people, uh, somebody who's somebody might be visiting somebody who was buried more recently. Uh, they should look into that. Absolutely. Um, I don't know it's, um, if there's any surveillance around there to check out cars and stuff like that. But um, that is to me, the most logical uh, analysis I can come up with as to where the guy would have parked and how he would have gotten to the girls and how he would have gotten back to his vehicle without being seen. Now, having said that, the question is, did anybody really see him? And that, except for the video, did anybody really see him? And that's one of the reasons I question because it is possible if he came, if he came from his car and walked down here and then walked over here and was just taking that walk and then somebody did say hello to him and he was up here and then the girls passed him. He went, ha, Eureka, maybe somebody did see him. And then he came back down here, killed the girls, shot off to his car. So it is possible that somebody did see him in that uh, on the other side of the bridge, just for a, a brief moment before he did anything and not afterwards. I think it's ridiculous. He would ever walk back that way. Uh, you know, with 
after killing somebody. I think he had to sneak through those 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 trees. Um, but yes, yeah, somebody could have seen him. He could have crossed the bridge. And then that's, you know, and I say there's two possibilities. One, he saw the girls on the road and he followed, he parked knowing they'd come down here and then went up up over here waiting for the girls, waiting for them to pass by. And then he followed them. Very possible. Or he didn't know the girls were going to be there. He visited the cemetery, came down, crossed the bridge. Oh, look, girls. And then followed them. And maybe somebody saw him before anything happened because, you know, before you kill anybody, you know, it's more likely that you're, you know, you're not going to think about who sees you. After you kill somebody, you really don't want to run into people. Now, oh, I want to point out one other thing I think is very interesting, which is why I tend to lean that he saw the girls before he went down there. Because I believe to get to those girls to cooperate, two girls, not just one, that he probably did have a weapon, probably had a gun that he pointed at him and said, down the hill. Now, normally, normally people don't necessarily wander around with their guns. They may. They may, but it's also possible he had the weapon in the vehicle, sees the girls, pulls into the cemetery and says, I'm going to go get those girls. I'm going to see if I can get them. And he reaches into the glove compartment, takes out his gun and puts it on him. And that's what we see. Maybe he has a gun with him as he's doing his walk. Doesn't mean he doesn't have a knife. He could have a knife as well. But it makes me think that it's possible that the gun was in the car and then he took the gun with him because he had a purpose for taking the gun with him. Now, so, um, yes, de definitely coerce him and going down the hill. I mean, th that seems like they weren't arguing with him. You know, I mean, at least as far as we know, um, it's just too much of a, 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 a command. And I believe he had to have something to make that command. Um, oh, what, oh, wait a minute. What do, what do you mean he's only killed once? It's not unusual for a killer like this to kill only once. How do we know? How do we know he's only killed once? We don't know if he's a rapist. Uh, first of all, serial killers are not necessarily rapists, but most of them are. Uh, but some of them aren't. Some of them like just to do other weird things. Um, uh, but serial serial, uh, serial rapists, for example, so they rape somebody. They might have raped before, but nobody ever caught them. They might rape again, but you don't have the connection to say that these crimes are connected. He could have be a serial killer who's killed before. He is a serial killer. Has he killed before? Maybe. Or maybe this is a first for him. Maybe he's done other stuff, but never killed. That's possible. So we just don't know. Uh, so, you know, but just because they haven't, just because they haven't caught him <laughs> doesn't mean that he hasn't done other, other kind of things like this. Um, <laughs> some interesting concepts here. Oh, yeah, I, I don't understand. They had a big press conference to release a completely different sketch and one more second of audio. Yeah, I don't know what the heck that was all about, Tina. Um, and I find... One of the concerns I have uh, sometimes with the way the police do um, speak to the public is if you're going to present something, present it with some logic and present it with some sense. Um, otherwise, people become confused and then they start becoming also mistrustful. Um, and they don't then they think, well, the police aren't going to believe me if I call them up or the police aren't doing their job or it's a, it's a police officer who killed her. You know, so it's better to be very methodical and be very for, forthright in whatever you're saying. And, you know, um, this is questionable, his style of walking. I don't know. He was, the people keep thinking he's limping. He's got a kind of weird walk like this. But he's also crossing, like, big open areas where it's hard to walk on the actual, uh, you know, the, uh, the wood. So he's got, he's stepping on railroad ties across there. So it's, it's a little a weird to walk on it anyway. So I don't know whether that means anything other than he's trying not to fall through the holes in the thing. So... <laughs> So I'm not sure about that. Um, his voice, they should really release more of his voice. I've heard it's about a 45 minute recording. We have heard again, watch out for all the people saying all the stuff that you have no idea if it's true. We don't know that's a 45 minute recording. That's, that's gossip. Um, don't know. And also um, don't know whether his voice is on the other 45 minutes. We don't know it because we don't know where the phone was. Now, this is interesting. And so let's, she's recording. Obviously does not know she's recording. A couple things could happen. Um, it could happen that when they went down the hill, when they finally got to where something happened, she may have dropped the phone nearby in, an, in under a leaf somewhere where they, he couldn't see it, but it was still recording. So there may be sounds and maybe certain things that you can hear. Maybe there's certain things you cannot hear. Um, Maybe the phone was under her body. Uh, we just don't know where Libby's phone exactly ended up during any other time. So we don't know how much we hear uh, about, you know, what's going on. If if there was more recording of his voice, 
um, depending on what he's saying, I think it is very important. For example, let's say he says, well, let's get on, dipsy do, <laughs> something like that. You're like, did he just say dipsy do? What the weird thing is that? Oh yeah, I would pro I would put that right out there on, uh, on you know to the public because some poor woman's going to go. Oh my God, my husband calls me Dipsy Doo too. You know, I mean that's an important thing for the public to know if it's something really weird like that. Um, so well, a lot of times what they don't do is put out information which, for example, an accent, um, people saying certain things, like let's say for example, uh, I need to do the needful. How many people know what, who probably says that? I need to do the needful. Does anybody know? I'm, I'm curious from my audience here. I need to do the needful. Have you ever heard that terminology before? <laughs> I, don't hear it in, I don't hear it in the US. I hear that in India. Instead of saying, oh, I need to do what's necessary or I, or I gotta do that, must do the needful. Uh, I won't do it with an Indian accent, so people don't have to get all upset with me. Uh, but I, I've, I sometimes now tend to say myself, I use needful. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no. She says, Is that, does that mean bathroom? No, actually, in India, you do this. You, you use your little finger and you go like that, and it means I have to go to the bathroom. But no, that's not it. Uh, needful just means I have to do, um, I have to do the important things. Uh, oh, Indians, that's, that is correct. Indians, yes. Uh, and but. Uh, no, it's a, where's the help? <laughs> I'm trying to get no. So needful just means I have to do what is necessary to do. Like you know, you need to your children. They 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 have to have lunch now. Okay, I need to go do the needful. Um, your your business needs to be focused more on uh, sales. I need to do the needful. That's all it means. So people have terminologies they use from like and, and I know in uh, Minnesota they say pop and here we say soda in Maryland. So if you hear somebody say pop, people in Maryland don't say that. So if they said anything, and if he said anything in the audio that was unique, a little bit different, uh, the way he pronounced something or unusual t word or some weird name calling or something he said, if it, let's say it was a rape and he said something weird during a rape, which, you know, which was somebody else is going, oh my God, my creepy husband. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, oh, good God. Um, maybe there were two killers and they recorded the film themselves to mislead the police. Oh my God, no. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, see, this is where fantasy starts going into. I understand how serial killers think. This is, this is not that kind of a thing. This is not super fancy, folks. This is not like a whole bunch of people. This isn't a pedophile ring. This isn't satanic anything. This is just a creepy dude, a creepy serial killer dude who had the opportunity to kill two girls. Um, and what he did to them, I do not know. Um, they, they said there were signatures. Some guy tried to say there were like three really unique things to the scene. I don't know. Depends how much he knows of serial killers. Uh, depends what he considers are unique. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you're correct. Three signatures. And I, oh, um, I don't, I tend to disagree a lot on this and I'll tell you why too many, too many, very few serial killers leave what you would actually call a a signature that was really overdone by the FBI where they started getting into every, every crime has a signature. And then you watch criminal minds and it's like, every crime has a signature. You know, it's a girl's got X on her chest or, you know, the, you know, some bow from, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, way back in the day. Um, most, most killers do not have signatures. They have mo, mo, MOs, modus operandi, a method of operation. They do, the stuff they do to commit actual crime. In other words, if you want to have power, you rape and kill somebody, you jump out of the bushes, most of the times the girls are like hit over the head, strangled and raped. And there's absolutely nothing there that tells you it looks different from the other, other one down the road or the one in the next state. Sometimes they try through the FBI to match all these different kinds of supposed signatures and the mode and, and the MOs. And a lot of times what you come up with is a whole bunch of people that kill just alike um, because only so many ways to kill people and most of them aren't that imaginative and it's a personal they're just doing their thing so what happens is if somebody's more unique the rare serial killer that's more unique they make a big thing out of it because he's creepy really creepy not just a little creepy he's super creepy and he makes a great hollywood film so he gets that but the stuff you see in hollywood where they're doing all these weird things leaving a signature that matches on every scene no, they hardly ever do that. As a matter of fact, 
sometimes they'll, com they'll commit a crime and they're supposedly a signature. Maybe one time he thought that was fun. The next time he doesn't do that. Maybe he didn't have time to do it. Maybe it, didn't, maybe it wasn't fun anymore. I mean, that, the reason people do signature stuff is it's fun. Um, there was a case out of Korea, which I think uh, I was asked to analyze this case a long time ago. Um, I think the killer put peach pits up the, the, the victim's vaginas. That's kind of weird. <laughs> I think maybe he liked peaches and he thought, well, this will be fun. You know, that is interesting. I cannot remember for the life of me whether he did that with every victim or it was just one victim that had that. And you go, oh, my God, you know, it's a signature. Was it just creepy? You know, it's just some dude that was eating peaches that day. So try not to get too obsessed with signatures. A lot of times they're not. Some signatures are in the mind of the profiler more than they're in the mind of the killer um, that they think it's a, uh, a signature. Um, let's say they did something like, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a, uh, something good. I, re I remember one that John Douglas said, which I always thought, I thought was kind of an interesting one, where a uh, husband and wife were, um, he was raping the, she made the husband uh, sit, go on his hands and knees, and he put a cup of tea on his back, and then he went and raped the wife. And now, is that a signature or is it an MO? Now, signature wise, it could be this is fun. Let me let the guy, that's funny to think of the guy kneeling you know, on his hands and knees with a cup of tea on his back while his wife is being raped. <laughs> or did he do that because if the guy moved, the teacup would fall, crash on the floor, and he'd know the husband was moving around? That's MO. That's not a signature. Uh, so, Douglas went with it was being a signature. I don't necessarily say it's a signature. I think it could have just been a good technique to keep the husband under control while he raped the wife. Um, no, I would say I'm open to both possibilities. So don't, you know, let's not exaggerate. Yeah, necessary for the crime is what it is. Yeah, um, uh, MO is necessary to commit the particular crime. Um, and it whatever crime is in your mind, now, remember, some of these guys that get bored with what they did last time, so they change up what they're doing. Uh, they, you know, they increase what they do because it's, you know, it's just, let's say after a while, it's like people in marriages, you know, they, or sexual relationships, they start out and it's like, oh, we just want to make love. And then I said, okay, let's do S&M. Like, Where did it go from making love to S&M? Okay, bondage. Okay, you know, really? What happened then? You know, you got bored. So you, first you only had sex in bed and now you have sex on the counter and you have sex in the living room and you have sex out in the deck and hope people are watching. You know, people are getting bored. Serial killers get bored too. They're like, well, I've done this before. And what? Okay, last time was okay, but let me have a little more fun. And so then they, maybe they knife somebody more or do some weird stuff because it's more interesting the next time around. So that way, the crimes may not even look alike. Like the first time, all he did was just, as one person would say, just rape her. And the next time, he carved her boobs. Why would he carve her breasts the next time around? Is that a signature? Or was he just, you know, and it, why doesn't it match the first crime? If it was a signature and he had to express himself on every crime. No, maybe he just got bored. Or maybe, maybe the bitch pissed him, pissed him off. She was uncooperative. So you're like, <laughs> Maybe it's not a signature. Maybe it just got pissed off. You know, so there's so much to be misunderstood. And this gets in the way of analyzing a crime for just what is what is rational and logical. Uh, and how to catch them doesn't depend on signatures. What catches them is getting information out to the public that will help you identify who it is. It's not fancy. It's not fascinating. It's not all, you know, oh, my God, the profile is so brilliant, blah, blah, blah. No. Um, it's that somebody told the public a piece of information that led them to knowing who it was. And hallelujah, that's what you want because you want the guy off the street. I don't care how you catch him. DNA, fabulous, you know. Witnesses, fabulous. The public, fabulous. A good detective work, fabulous. A good profiler, fabulous. Let's get the guy caught. So you want to do the correct things. Um, what? Now, see this, this. Okay. I believe it was a planned event and bridge guy was sent by whom and what, what would be the point? I mean, this is, this is this, this again, don't like it. This is this, this is, this is, um, this is fantastical stuff coming off of these stupid shows that are saying, okay. And he was involved in drugs or they did this or so-and-so was out. This is all nonsense. There's no evidence of this at all period. And I don't go where there's no evidence. I mean, so I don't, and I don't like um, these shows putting out, information and and 
and theories that have no basis in evidence. Uh, and that's what that's what too many of these YouTube shows do. Um, the only thing I was willing to comment on was was the the possible reason he picked this location, how he would have picked it, and why he would have maybe been parked at the cemetery. Now, I want to point out something about profiling, just so you understand what profiling is, because people misunderstand this as well. Profiling, what I did was do an analysis. Now, if 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 I had this information and the police asking me what I thought, and I didn't have any more information that was going to narrow things down, I would say, here is my theory as to why this makes sense. I would pose it to the police. Here is my theory about why he may have parked at the cemetery. Um, I'm not going to say, I, I'm going to say he's a white, well, I can say he's a white guy because he looks white. Okay. He lives with his mother and has a dog and and like has a knife collection. That's nonsense. If I say that as a profiler, I'm making up shit. Don't make up crap. And a lot of profilers make up stuff that has no evidence to base it on. I don't know if this guy lived with his mother, lived with his wife. I don't know if he's been to school. He's got high school diploma. He's been to community college or he was in the army. All that stuff is made up out of the profiler's head. Usually, sometimes these profiles are done. They're kept secret. And then when they catch the guy, if it doesn't match, they just hide the profile. <laughs> or they just pick out things that the profile said that were right. And oh, 90% of the profile was right. What 90%? That he was a white male? And was a psychopath? Well, we already know that. Everybody knows that. That's 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 obvious. Um, but I would tell the police, based on the evidence, here is why I believe they may have been targeted, because, but as an opportunity thing, because nobody really knew they were going there, that he saw them get out of the car for, you know, happened to be on the road, whatever, pulled over in the cemetery, knows the area, saw an opportunity, and went and didn't know what was going to happen, but went and did it. That would be the explanation, my analysis to the police. Now, the police should not take this as some kind of absolute, oh my God, it's criminal profiler Pat Brown. This is what happened. No, this is an investigative analysis to help look for leads. That's it, to help look for leads. So then that thought would be, was, the car parked in the, was there a car parked in the cemetery? Where Did, did he see the girls get out? And then they would look into the cemetery issue of was somebody buried there. They could look into that um, recently. Uh, they could look into just anybody see a car in the cemetery. Um, anybody who was in that area, you know, there's things they could look at. Uh, and who would know specifically this whole spot here? Somebody who had previously parked in the cemetery and walked down here, they would look at that. Now, as more information comes in, might be some really great information that comes in and you reanalyze a case. You know, you don't turn in a profile so that they can absolutely f believe everything that's in it. It is investigative leads. And it's nothing different than what detectives do. Um, detectives do the same thing. They look at all the information and they figure out what leads they should follow. Now, one of the problems sometimes it, with cases like this is that the detectives haven't come in contact with serial homicide cases. They don't know really how to analyze it. They're not profilers. Uh, they haven't been trained in uh, crime scene analysis, haven't been trained in behavioral analysis. They really sometimes just don't know what they're looking at. Um, and they do a lot of guesswork. Uh, that's something I'm trying, and I hope in the future will be will change, that there will be more solid understanding of how to do crime scene analysis for detectives. And, you know, a lot of detectives, when they come, they don't go to detective school. People think they do. They don't. They're, they're police officers get promoted into detective positions. They learn on the job. Some of them do get to get some training. Hopefully, they get sent to get something. But, you know, a lot of times they don't get much training. Um, and, and also, it depends on logic. You know, some people are great police officers but suck as detectives because they have no logic ability. Other ones are so logical that just they're amazing investigators because they're able to sit down and say what makes sense and not jump to conclusions. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, you know, detectives, you know, people have to apply for a job as a police officer. Then you have to be chosen to be a detective. And then, you know, you have to have the opportunity to learn and to study and to, and to have experience. And it's just, you know, some have, and you have to have the logic thing going. You, uh, so, you know, to get all that in one package um, is sometimes, you know, it's questionable. And also serial homicides are extremely difficult to solve. So give the guys a break. They're doing the best they can. And it's very, very hard. So why did he choose two girls? Oh, this is a good question. Why did he choose two girls? Wasn't it too risky? Not if you have a gun. How risky is it? You know, you, should, you, know, you we don't have, you know, you can't assume that he wanted to necessarily 
rape and murder the two girls. He might've just wanted one, but you know, you can shoot one of them and you just, you just have one left, um, you know? Uh, and he, so he might have liked the looks of one of them um, and gone after her and her friend was just going to be collateral damage. Uh, so if you're going to kill one, you might as well kill two. I mean, it's not a big deal, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and you kill that one off first. And then once you kill the first one, the second one is scared out of her mind and she's completely beside herself. So, She's going to cooperate and do whatever she's got to do. Now, I, you know, I, I don't know any of the history of this case yet. Uh, I don't know who, what the, what, what happened to the girls. I mean, people will say, well, what do you think? Was it Libby, Abby, whatever? Well, Libby was the stronger one. She was the older one and was more the dominant one um, in this relationship as friends. And so I'm going to say she was probably that way with, with this whole episode too. If I were the killer, I'd knock off a Lib, uh, Libby first and then just, have my way with 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 Ab, um, Abby because it's it's easier, you know. Get rid of the strong one and deal with the weak one. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, so it's it's hard to say uh, because we don't have evidence of what happened. I mean, there, theoretically, he could have had a, a rope to tie them up with. I don't know what they're wearing on their. their what, what they're wearing on their feet. So, you know, you can use shoe ties, you can use a belt, you can use a rope in your pocket. You can tie them up or you can not tie them up. You could just kill one. So both of you, like, here, here, just got down the hill, girls, get down the hill, cross that creek, get across the creek, lay on the ground. Girls lay on the ground. You take out a knife, you kill one. Now you got the other one. I mean, that's possible. Or, or, or I'm going to rape her first and you, if you do anything, I'll, I'll kill her. Okay. Well, in that case, I'm going to let you rape her. You know, because I, you're gonna you're gonna kill me or kill kill her, whatever. So I'll cooperate. It's very easy to get uh, to to handle two girls. It's not a big deal. Um, so you know, so it's you know, it's, that's why people start saying there's three guys and there's this guy, and it's like, oh my god, no, you know, they're they're two little teenage girls. I mean, I don't know what two adult women would do in that circumstance. Maybe the same. They react the same way. The guy's got a gun. The guy tells you to lay down. He says he's going to kill one of you. You cooperate. I mean, happens all the time. Um, so, you know, it's it, it's it's important, I say, not to get carried away with the rumors and, and the nonsense. So uh, I'm just trying. What in the world? Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, yeah. So that that's my, that's my take on the whole thing. Uh, I, I know. I wasn't sure when I was asked to do this, whether there was anything to talk about, but what I really wanted to talk about was where I think the police investigation, should, you know, how it should be handled as far as getting information to the public um, and not, not playing games with a serial killer, uh, why it's gone unsolved for four years, which is not unusual for a serial homicide case, that it is a cold case. So let's not say it's not a cold case. It's a cold case. Um, uh, will it ever be solved? I don't know. A good portion of serial homicides are never, are never solved or they're solved 20 years after the fact. Uh, which is really a shame. Um, uh, and yes, is this guy still out there? Yeah, he is still out there. Is he a danger? Absolutely, still a danger. Uh, will he kill again? Very likely. He, he won't kill again uh, for a number of reasons. One is he he's dead. Uh, let's say he got in a car wreck and he's dead and he's, you know, you, you never find the guy because he never commits another crime. Uh, could happen. He could have cancer. He could be dead of cancer or he could have, you know, already been dying of cancer when he attacked the girls and he's just, you know, I was going to be dead. Uh, he could be, uh, go to, he could move out of the country and you never see him again. Uh, he could just decide, okay, they're going to get me. So I'm just not going to do it again. It does happen. Serial killers do get scared um, because they sometimes think that if I make, uh, if I do this again, I'm going to get caught. Um, we don't know. And a lot of times we don't, reason we don't know how often serial killers stop is because when they do, <laughs> and they're not caught. We don't know about it. We know about the guys that get caught. We know about the guys who then have 20 killings. Uh, a lot of times too, when people, you know, they kill one girl uh, and they get caught, but because the police have not connected them to other crimes, they're prosecuted for that one crime. They're put away in prison, but they're not called a serial killer. Even though they abducted, raped and murdered a young girl, they're not called a serial killer because they don't have the other crimes to link them to. Well, I think it's nonsense. Anybody who uh, uh, kidnaps uh, 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 or, or jumps out of the bushes and rapes and murders somebody they do not know, that is a serial killer. I don't care whether you know what else he's done. 
And so they don't get labeled that. So we have, we actually have way more serial killers in the US than we even know. Uh, a lot of times too, we have more than one serial killer in the same area. So what happens is, let's say you've got in an area over 10 years, you've got 10 different serial homicides. Sometimes people assume it's one guy. Maybe it's three guys. Maybe it's two guys. You know, we don't know. Maybe it's four guys. <laughs> so there are way more than we realize, and they don't strike as often as people think. So consequently, you know, uh, you know, we have a we have a lot of misconceptions about serial serial killers. Um, and and that's one of the reasons I, I might as well bring that up right now. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I wrote a lot of the books I wrote um, was because I try to get rid of these misconceptions. And now let me point out a couple of them. Okay, so uh, these these are three books I've written. Uh, the Profiler, which is people who, detectives and uh, families of victims really like this book because it, I'm telling the truth about how a crime should be profiled and how things go wrong. Uh, people who love the FBI and criminal minds absolutely hate the book and give me one star reviews um, <laughs> because I think, oh, that's complete nonsense. Um, over over here, I have Killing for Sport, which is about serial killers. And I try to get rid of the myths of serial killers in that particular book because I know it's a little, I have a lot of, um, you know, black humor in it. You know, I mean, it's people say, oh my God, I'm kind of, you know, a lot of it's a little bit snide. That's me. Um, but I'm trying to get across the points that people believe stuff that's just not true. You know, like, oh, they have, you know, well, you should make them feel bad. Feel bad? They don't feel bad. And my favorite line on that is, and I'm, I always forget the name, Clifford Olson, I believe. My favorite line of all time, where some, the police said to him, why don't you tell where the other kids are that you killed, where the bodies are? And so you can, you know, you can help the parents, you know, get over this. And he goes, well, if I cared about the, if I care about the parent, if I cared about the parents, I wouldn't have killed their kids. And that's my favorite line of all time, because it's true. They don't have remorse. And so the concept, you know, when you're trying to understand serial killers and psychopaths and you don't understand how they operate and what they're really true because of Hollywood and about a bunch of nonsense that's put out there, then, then you sort of just misunderstand a whole lot of things. And so those are, those are two books, um, which uh, are, are good for reading to understand profiling and investigative stuff. Um, and I have other books, which you can, you know, welcome to read. They're on Amazon, unless you're into Madeline McCann, in which case this book is not on Amazon because it was banned. Um, and you can find it at Smashwords or Barnes and Noble or other places. This one's, this one is on Amazon. And if you, if you don't know the Madeline McCann case, this, this one, which is called 10 missing and murdered children's cases that have nothing to do with Madeline McCann, you won't get the point of the book and you'll hate it. So I got, I've got five star reviews and I've got one star reviews, five stars from people who know the Madeline McCann case and one star from everybody who doesn't. <laughs> you know? So ah, that's fine. Oh, and if you just, uh, uh, and if you want a, a fun uh, book to read just uh, over the summer, a summer good uh, summer read. Uh, I do recommend uh, this one over here, Only the Truth. It's my fiction book. Um, it's a it's a psychological mystery story, uh, cr a criminal mystery story, um, and it's only two ninety nine at Amazon, so it's it's a cheapie, and it is not on paper. Unfortunately, it's only in Kindle, but you can download Kindle so you can read it. So it's it's a well loved book. So I recommend that one. So anyway. That is where I'm at um, for today. Anybody have any last questions? Anything I want to say before I take off and actually go celebrate the 4th of July? So, oh, read the McCann. You, oh, thank you. Read the McCann one. You speak the truth. I totally agree and respect your views there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it kind of put <laughs> some, it's, it's funny because some people said, oh my God, you know, you must have made a ton of money off of the McCann case, you know, because you, you know, no, are you kidding me? If I want to make a ton of money, I would have said the McCann's, it was an abduction and the McCann's were totally innocent and man, I would have made a fortune, but no, <laughs> I did not make money off of that case. Probably lost money, but um, uh, it's a very fascinating case, which is why, uh, and, oh, here, I, I want to point this out. This is a good question. Smiley says, unbelievable, really impossible to understand the mind of a psychopath. Actually, it's not, um, but I'll let you, I'll help you understand Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I'll help you understand it. Um, psychopaths are like us. They really are. They're, they're not totally different human beings. There are healthy human beings, but we all have these issues. And then psychopaths just have them to an extent. For example, you know, we all have, there's a level of empathy. Uh, a healthy human being has empathy. A uh, person who gets up to, to psychopathy and has no empathy except for himself. Um, 
And, and you say, well, how is that the same? Well, there are things that we do not have empathy for. Um, I'm going to tell you that. Uh, uh, so you, you can you can think in your own life. There's a few people you go, yeah, I don't have an empathy for them. Maybe it's maybe it's somebody on death row, a serial killer on death row. Do you have empathy? Do you, how many of you have empathy for the man who killed these two girls? I'm, I'm, mine's a little little small right now. You know, I mean, maybe it's the most decent human being in the world. I would say he's one of God's creatures, and and I understand he, bad, he had a bad life or something. So uh, you know, we have to forgive him. Okay, I'm not really feeling it. You know, okay, so I kind of lack having empathy for, for serial killers. Um, but serial killers have empathy, empathy for nobody. So they're just extreme. In other words, they're, they have been blighted so much that just at that end of things. Um, uh, for example, another example would be, uh, you know, uh, selfishness. You know, we all have some level of selfishness. Of course we do. Like when you play a game, when I play table tennis, I actually want to beat your butt. You know what I mean? I don't go, oh, let's have a fun game and let's have an even score and let's have nobody win. <laughs> That's not the way I play table tennis. You know, I'm like, no, I want to kill you. <laughs> now, I do have some empathy for when you lose. I say, oh, sorry, you know, but part of me is going, you know. Uh, so there's a selfishness that I enjoy winning. There's a selfishness that I, you know, if I'm going for, let's say I'm going for a job I really want. Let's say, you know, I've been up for some kind of television show. Wouldn't I like to get it? You know, wouldn't I prefer to get it over those other twenty people? You're damn straight. I want to. I want to get the job. And twenty people are going to be sad because they didn't get the job, but I'm still going to be happy if I got it. So you know, there is some selfishness there. But when you get to a psychopath, he's just super, super selfish. In other words, he has never found a way to win in life that makes him happy, and so he is so selfish that he's got to have everything for himself. It's just more of an extremeness. To that level he is still a human being he's just a very very disturbed human being and as far as understanding like bizarre things let's face it we all have some bizarre interests in life uh you know the other people do not understand i happen to be a lizard lover i like iguanas and and if any hill is still here she knows uh, i like lizards other people go oh that's kind of creepy why does she like lizards okay you don't like lizards i like lizards you know okay it, it, you know <laughs> so and if you go on, you know, if you have people are hanging around on porn sites, well, no, the perversions and sexual stuff is, are pretty, pretty bizarre. So that that a serial killer would have his perversions or would have his fantasies or would have things he likes that other people don't like is not impossible. So, you know, so it's it's it would they're just they're they're humans. They're just very, very stunted humans to the point where they hate everybody else that's why they're serial killers psychopaths generally speaking it's all they just something happened in their lives where other people stop mattering to them they may pretend they matter and they may use them i always say the number one statement for psychopath is you're either useful or you're in the way and that is very true that's why they get married because it's like oh she's useful i get sex every night or every other night and she makes me food and she maybe she has a stable job and i don't so i get married she's great i like her Unless I decide one day I don't like them, in which case I kill her. But then, you know, kids do. Kids can be useful and they make me feel good. I'm a, I'm a man. I have, two, I have some children. Oh, now they're annoying. I'll kill them. So because I have a new girlfriend. Uh, so, you know, that's how these things work. So we're you're not inhuman. They're just very, very damaged humans. And understanding them is useful. So we can understand them and we should understand them because that's how they work. And once you understand how they work, you can then understand how to identify them and how to deal with them. And, and, you know, if you're an investigative person, you can, when you're sitting there talking to one of them, you might say to yourself, you know, I think he is a psychopath rather than I thought he was a nice guy <laughs> and you missed it completely. So it's important to understand them. Uh, if you, okay. They have no boundaries. Well, yeah, no. Uh, they have no boundaries. Um, well, they have, they may, they say, they think they have boundaries. See, we all have boundaries, things we'll do and things that we won't do. Uh, some of them, you know, that's why some of them say, Oh, I'd never kill a child. Now it's not because they are empathetic toward a child, but it just, you know, what kind of, what kind of superhero kills a child? I think I'm a superhero. I only kill women. <laughs> you know? So they have those. Uh, yeah, that's okay. You're useful or in the way this, I mean, truly, this is my absolutely, I think I coined this. Um, 
my favorite one that I coined, and I think I did coin it, um, because it's so true. You are useful or you're in the way. And if you understand that is exactly how they work, you, you know what happens when you get hooked up with one and you shouldn't be hooked up with one. So, <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go spend 4th of July because I should have some fun today uh, instead of talking about very sad cases. But again, uh, please do like, please do subscribe. Please, oh, and this one, please do tell people about it. No, share this with people because I know people are very interested in the Adelphi case. Um, and if you're still here, please do share it with any, some place. And the reason I want this shared is because people are going to those other sites and they're getting massive amounts of misinformation and, and, and fantastical theories. And it's just very, very sad and it's, it's not healthy. And I have a fly coming around here. Go away. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, this will be the one and only one I do, barring something really significant that's worth worth, you know, actually going going back and talking about. Um, my analysis is here. It's it's simple. It it's based on evidence. That is as far as I think things need to go. And I'm not saying there's other people who don't have good analyses. They do, but we just got to keep away from really wild, wide ranging guesswork and nonsense and. It's it's just disservice to the families. It's a disservice to the community. It's a disservice to everyone essentially. So please do share this uh, video with people to show show them that there's something out here where you can look at things sensibly and not get carried away. Um, and I do hope they solve this crime. But you know I don't know uh, the new guy Caldwell. Could he be the guy? Uh, you know I don't know. I mean I don't have enough of the inside uh, information. He he's a creepy dude who is obviously a child child sex predator. The child he grabbed was a child. These girls are pre, uh, teens. And by the way, there is a huge difference. And people keep grouping pedophiles with guys who like teens. That's the same thing that happened when we're looking at uh, uh, Epstein in my last uh, last uh, video. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein. He liked teen girls. Um, in other words, fresh young women. Still women, to some extent. And, you know, when you think about in old days, marriageable age was 13 and 14. You know, that's not, they're, they're not children. They're, they're, they're young women. And even though we might think it's repulsive for a 30-year-old man to want to be with a 13-year-old girl, that's not pedophilia. That's a guy who likes really young, fresh girls. Um, and very, you know, hasn't been around the block a bunch of times. Um, so... The, so Caldwell, I think his name is Caldwell. Caldwell, I keep forgetting his name now. Um, the newest guy, uh, he as a nine-year-old child, he said, "Come and see my puppy." You know, uh, pedophile. That's a pedophile. Um, so he's a child predator. Now, having said that, it is not impossible for a guy who goes for a child to go for older ones too. But it's a very different style of crime. Very different. Um, and I see no, at this point, no connection to the Delphi murders. But what the police know, I do not know. And so we'll see if anything pans out. But, you know, what happens is people just get really excited really quickly. Oh, my God, they finally got the guy. You know, maybe not. Um, I do hope so. I mean, and and, and there are anomalies. Uh, serial killers are sometimes weird things happen. There's a, Once in a while, there's an anomaly. You just go, oh, you wouldn't, wouldn't expect that. But so it is. Uh, so. All I want is the guy to be caught too. I don't care what the method is that they use as long as it's legal um, and, and capturing the guy. Um, and I do hope that they maybe if they have some more information they could put out to really think, is it worth keeping this so, you know, hidden so that when you have that interview, he'll confess and you'll know it's him. Is it really worth it compared to even finding out who the guy is? If you, if the information will benefit the public, not if it's just, you know, just, stuff for people to go, oh, that's really horrible. No, if it's really useful information. So let's, oh, please read the what? Please read comment sections on the future for further quick. Oh yeah, oh no, I always do that. Um, I, I uh, Let me tell you something about this. Um, I always do lead, read the comment sections, uh, I, t I try. Uh, what happens is if you get your, if you get your questions in early, <laughs> It come, it pops up. I'm, I'm still trying to understand how YouTube actually works, but they send me your notifications. Here are your new comments. And I go and I look um, at the new ones. I try to answer everything that comes in. Um, but sometimes what happens is after it starts getting out of hand, like there's a few hundred of them, it's like, hey, I'll, I can't find them anymore. And, and, and YouTube doesn't notify me. And sometimes when I click on the notification, 
it doesn't go to the actual actual statement and I can't respond to it. I don't know what's wrong with the issue with YouTube. So I, I don't know. Um, but I, I do my best to uh, try to answer as many questions as I can uh, if, if, if there's something useful. So anyway, so the last victim, I, th I know that one for some reason. I just threw up there, the last victim. What is that one? That sounds familiar and I don't know why. Uh, what is it? Whoever... Okay, Raven, you said the last victim to your list of suggestions. What is that book? Because I just, it rings a bell and I don't know why it's ringing a bell. So you can tell me, I'd like to know. Oh, well, I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't know why it's ringing a bell. So anyway, uh, please read on the Murdoch murders. Oh, okay. the murder, is that? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll put that down on my little list. <laughs> so. I, I will do that. Um, hold on a second. Somebody has asked me, do I want that? Nope. Okay, sorry. Somebody's asked me if I want a veggie sub from Subway. I don't like Subway, so I'm going to answer no. I'll just bring some cherries and eat cherries for my and maybe wine. But I don't. I don't really like Subway. Sorry, guys. I don't like Subway. Uh, murder on murder. So I'm going to put that down on my list. Murder on murders. Um, and because uh, uh, I, I'm not familiar with that really. But I will put that on there because I have I have heard of them before, so I think. So, oh shoot, I just did something wrong. Um, murder. Okay, murders. Okay, I'll check into it. So anyway, you can always you can always uh, put those in comments. Uh, and I try, I try to do as much as I can to to catch up with these things. Sometimes I can't do it, so I do my best. So anyway, I hope everybody's going to have a really nice uh, time. Uh, uh, for the rest of 4th of July, go watch some fireworks. If your area is having them, have a nice party. And uh, I'm off to have some free time myself. So I'll see you next week. See y'all. Bye. <laughs>